One of the vendors has that. Yeah, I know. Jesus, sissy. I do. Yeah, he meant Raph. Wow, everyone just got really quiet. <laughs> Don't mind us, we're just having a casual conversation up here. So I guess we're starting? Yeah? Well, wait a minute. We'll go on schedule. Talk amongst yourselves. Yeah. So it's 3.30. We'll get started. Uh, I'm not sure if I need the mic because you're going to hear me regardless. My name's Andrew Hay. I'm the Chief Evangelist at Cloud Passage. And uh, yeah, well, we'll get started. Come on, work with me. Oh. Always the way. This thing's not even working at all here now. <laughs> all right, any questions? Hey, now we're talking. It's going to work, though? Uh, maybe. All right. So what we're going to talk about today, it's facilitating fluffy forensics. The title is very alliterative. Uh, but we're going to talk about the capability to do forensics in the cloud and the benefits and some of the problems with actually doing forensics in the cloud. Uh, I you know, A little bit about me. Uh, I don't have a, one of those about me slides. Uh, I've done quite a few forensic investigations working for a university, for a bank in Bermuda. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't do forensics on a day-to-day -day basis right now. I work for a cloud security company. Uh, but you know, this is something that's been really interesting to me as clouds evolved and people are starting to use it more. Because I know a lot of law enforcement and they're not really looking forward to having to do cloud investigations. Awesome. So just an over, so who here knows how to do forensics, traditional forensics? Oh, you know, that's more than I expected. So what, I just want to do a very quick 10,000 foot whirlwind tour. Um, and this thing is going to go out the window. All right. So. Traditional forensic incident response, this is a very common slide that I'm sure you've seen in NIST documentation over the years. This is the four-step NIST uh, forensic technique, forensic incident response life cycle, where you know, we have collection, examination, analysis, reporting, feeds back into itself so that we have our lessons learned and we can do things better as we go, grow forward. And these are the things that we do. You know, we collect the media, we have data that we examine, there's information derived from that data, and then we have evidence, hopefully, that we can present to indicate, you know, to either provide uh, positive reinforcement that there was a breach or uh, information stating that there was not any sort of malicious activity. We'll simplify it a bit, and I've seen this actually come up in quite a few uh, research papers. This is what they're doing now, acquisition analysis reporting. Very easy to remember, acquisition analysis reporting. Exactly the same processes, just kind of condensed a little bit. When we're talking about acquisition, we're talking about the images and the data that is resident on the system. So physical partitions, logical partitions, folder contents, uh, actual image files that are on the system, like ISOs and DMG files and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, this are things that we're very familiar with gathering from a forensics perspective because this is what we've been taught over the years. This is what we go for for acquisitions. Changes a little bit in cloud. Once we have all this information, we start analyzing it. So this, if you're not familiar with Windows, this is some of the things that you can look at for Windows forensics. Uh, OS version may or may not be helpful. Uh, you know, shutdown time, time zones, what drives were mounted by the user, who was the last user that logged in. These are all things that can help you build a timeline to actually see what happened forensically on the system. 
We also have the volatile pieces, so your system information, your memory, your network connection, what's running, what's not running, uh, users that are currently logged in, the internet history. These are all things that help you build that timeline and actually point to what's going on. And then we have the tools that help us kind of stitch all this stuff together. You know, we've got our traditional forensic reporting tools, some open source tools. Anyone here use the SANS SIFT kit at all? Pretty powerful. I like it. I'm a big fan. Um, log management tools, a lot of tools are starting to take their data, export them in Ceph format or some other sort of easily consumable format and then using tools like Splunk or Sumo Logic to search through and index so that they don't have to spend all of their time staring at an Excel spreadsheet over and over again. And speaking of Excel spreadsheets, which is how I always did my investigations, uh, those are the poor people tools, VI, Notepad, MS Excel. So who here uses an enterprise tool versus the poor people tools for their forensic investigations? Show of hands. Who's the poor people tools? Yeah, the majority. Because <laughs> these are expensive and complicated. In terms of cloud architectures and some of the challenges, and I, I, I'm going to tell you now, this isn't a the sky is falling, we have no hope kind of talk. I don't do those. I want to give you a stuff you can walk away with. So, damn it. Any minute now, any minute now. So cloud architectures, we have on-prem bare metal data centers that are serving as private clouds. We have private clouds. We have hybrid clouds. We have public clouds, your Amazons and go grids of the world. You know, the problem is that one thing that I hear quite a bit is, well, what do you mean by cloud? Because everyone has their own definition, or at least their own idea in their head of what cloud is to them. Uh, for a lot of people, cloud means salesforce.com. And I get a lot of people coming to me saying, hey, can you secure my salesforce.com? Like, for enough money, I can do anything. <laughs> so, you know, are you talking private, public, hybrid? Are you talking um, you know, SaaS, PaaS, infrastructure as a service, on-prem, hosted, shared, you know, single tenant, multi-tenant, a known number of tenants? These are all things that really complicate your forensic investigation. All right, it worked. So you may have seen this diagram before. For, we're going to talk about infrastructure as a service primarily uh, because it's most closely related to you know, traditional forensics, traditional systems architectures. So SaaS, you know, customer responsible for the data, provider responsible for everything here and down. That's a lot. Platform as a service, a little bit of shared with the app code, maybe some of the framework, but again, data, customer responsibility. When we get to infrastructure as a service, and Amazon AWS, probably the most prevalent one that people are familiar with, you are responsible from the hypervisor, or sorry, from the virtual machine up. So the provider will take care of the hypervisor down to the plugs. And Amazon and Microsoft and a bunch of other of the cloud uh, infrastructure as a service cloud providers, they explicitly state Customers should assume responsibility and management of, you know, everything up to and including the operating system and the data. You know, you have to enhance security on your own with the addition of host-based controls. So that's them indemnifying themselves against having to be a service provider for the entire stack. So they're going to provide you with the architecture to do cloud computing and you are responsible for doing this stuff up here, which is great but uh, from a forensic acquisition standpoint, we're really used to having all this kind of stuff down here too, and being able to go up to the box and log into it physically and segregate it if we need to, and start pulling drives and you know freezing memory. Anyone ever do that? Has anyone done that? I was at a presentation not too long ago where the guy he's like, "Yeah, you can freeze the memory and pull it out, and then we can pull information off it." I'm like. Is it 1986? Because nobody does that anymore. That's short. Have you done it recently? So, so one person does it. <laughs> uh, 
the, the major challenges that we're going to talk about cloud computing based on those architectures that we were just discussing, discussing, discussing is data, data residence, where it resides, the physical acquisition problems. We're so used to having physical access to these systems, so physical acquisition was always great and easy. Isolating the instance, hypervisor introspection and data integrity. This is one of the biggest concerns that you know, lawyers have. How can you prove that no one else has actually accessed this stuff before? And then lack of collaboration and support. So data residence, essentially. Huh? Huh? <laughs> oh yeah? Oh, that's good. Um, I can't remember who it was. Someone told me, oh, uh, Andrew Storms at N-Circle. He did some of the initial QA for Carmen San Diego. <laughs> so where is the data? We need to know where the data is. And one of the main reasons is you need to know if a lawyer or someone comes to you to say, prove to me your results, you should be able to say, my data is here. This is the source of the data. This is where it resides. And here's the information I was able to derive from that data and all of my analysis. That's very difficult in cloud environments. And I'll, I'll show you why. Ah, contract language. So AWS, where is my data stored? Your objects are redundantly stored on multiple devices across multiple facilities. That's helpful. Um, it's helpful for operational efficiency, but it's not so great for forensic acquisition. Because how are you supposed to be able to point to your data store and say, I can authoritatively say that this is the only place that my data resides? With this sort of indemnification, you can't really. Um, this, this actually isn't so bad. This one, Microsoft may transfer customer data within a major geographic region. And it'll replicate between two subregions within the same major region for enhanced data durability. Not security, durability. So it's going to be very durable, but you're not going to be able to find it. It's kind of a big problem. Uh, this is where you need to start working with the, customer, or with the uh, cloud service provider to say, hey, can you show me everywhere my data is and some sort of proof that it is there? Because I'm going to need that, because I can't derive that myself. And you've, you've contractually said that I don't need to do that. Now, physical acquisition. What's the, uh, the standard procedure for acquiring a physical drive image? Anyone? Chart? Yeah, so a software shim of sorts to copy the, the physical device data off and do another drive or an image for analysis or a full data replication from hardware to hardware. Those are usually your options. Um, if you go to Amazon and say, hey, I've had an incident. I'd like to physically copy that drive that, that all my data resides on. Probably not going to happen. They're not even going to do that for the FBI. And there's... There's reasons uh, that they're not going to do that because it's a shared multi-tenant environment and it opened themselves up to, I'm sure, lots of litigation. But uh, they have created some tools that I'll talk about in a minute here that will make this easier and it kind of shows you the process that they go through. Uh, so, you know, you're, you're either going to have to uh, work with your cloud service provider to get that data and some of them do offer that service and uh, you, or you may just be stuck with snapshots and logical information. So your live acquisition, your volatile memory and volatile information co collection, that may have to be enough. So I'm, I'm going to focus on AWS because that's where most of my, you know, I'll call it research, uh, but it's really reading and sort of investigation has been. These are the three ways that I know that you can get images from an AWS environment. And it's funny, I was actually talking with Chort back and forth on IM, and one of the things, he's like, wow, you can do that? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I found something awesome. So snapshot of the EBS volume, mount, copy it locally. So you copy the image file down. Uh, you can have AWS ship you, from the ship you the data. You have to send them a drive first, but we'll get that in a second here. Or you can use these AMI tools, which I found on Thursday. 
And I'm like, hey, these are pretty cool. You know, this, this seems like it solves all of the problems. Compress, encrypt, and sign a snapshot. And then I can use that for my forensic analysis. So for the image acquisition, acquisition on AWS, you know, launch a clean Linux AMI. Stop the instance of the root volume that you want to actually look at. Detach that volume. Create a snapshot. Attach it. Oh, that didn't work out well. Stupid thing. Um, all right. So you create created new. Oh, sorry. Bah. So you create the image. The slide's kind of screwed up here now. Um, yeah. Uh, you, so you mount it on your forensic workstation, your other AMI that you created. Uh, you can then image that drive, create, use DD to actually copy it, and then copy it off once you're done. Uh, copy it locally and do forensic analysis as if you would a, a physical drive. It's pretty convoluted, but this is actually information provided by someone at Amazon to a customer. And you know, you, know, you want to make an image of the EBS root volume. And then he went through this whole post. And uh, uh, I thought I had the link to that, but I don't. But he goes through the steps like, oh, you want to do this, and then this, then this, then this, then this. And it is kind of convoluted. Um, but it is kind of a dirty way to get the job done. This is what they would prefer you do, and that's use the S3 buckets. So uh, using Amazon S3, which is just their big storage bucket service, you can ship them a drive and say, hey, I've got an image, a forensic image, and I'd like it sent to me, which is great if it's a very big drive image. They'll put it onto your portable media, and then they'll ship it back to you via FedEx. So anyone have problems with that from a chain of custody perspective? Because you're kind of giving it to someone else and saying, yeah, so I'll wait here then, and you'll just ship me the data. OK, I'll wait here. That, that, that kind of bugs me, especially you know, like I want to be involved in the process from start to finish. I don't want to be sitting there and saying, oh, OK, I'll just, well, i got a couple days. I can wait. Uh, did someone say something? Sorry? No. All right. I'm hearing stuff from out there. You know, that might be the only way is have the FedEx guy sign a chain of custody form. But if you tell him why he's doing it, he's going to be like, uh, I don't think I'm allowed to do that. <clears throat> Unless you use like a bonded service. They don't. They use, I think it is FedEx. Um, <clears throat> this is probably the biggest problem. So in this report by uh, Dykstra and Sherman, it's great that you can do this, but you still can't verify the integrity of the forensic image. Because, it, well, one, it's out of your hands, and two, it's, you know, they're just copying the image from the S3 bucket onto a, or the snapshot onto your drive and sending it to you. Then I found this, which, you know, it, it doesn't seem, at least I haven't seen it very highly publicized, and I bounced it off a couple of friends of mine that do quite a bit of forensics. And so on one hand, they don't do cloud forensics because no one's asked them to do it. And on the other hand, they thought, OK, well, this, this might get the job done, but we haven't really researched it. So uh, you're going to have to take this as is, uh, because I haven't done you know, physical research of this. But some of this information did come from the uh, Dijkstra Sherman uh, report. And there's an experiment later on that kind of gives you some of the timelines. So this EC2 bundle volume, what it'll do is it'll compress, encrypt, and sign a snapshot. And you can take that and you can move it over to an S3 bucket and then say, OK, hey, Amazon, ship that to me. Short. This is, so the documentation just said the root file system. I suspect that anything mounted would probably have to be acquired on your own. Uh, you might have to call them to find out, honestly. I know it seems like kind of a, a pain, but. Uh, from the, the documentation that I was reading, from the root file system, when they mean that, I think they're talking about like, uh, like a physical image. So not a fly? All right. Uh, uh, part of me thinks that they would take the entire system image and back that up. Like, I think that's what they're going to acquire using this. I don't think it's just going to be like slash. And then uh, like let uh, slash op go if you have that on a separate volume or anything. Yes. Am 
Is it? Oh, awesome. So yeah, nullified. So migrating the bundle. So you can move it from region to region. If you want to move it from Europe over to you know, USA East or US East, this would make you know, copying it down a lot faster. Um, then you can download the bundle. So this will download the bundle to your system so you don't have to wait for the drive to be sent to you. Seems kind of cool, warrants further investigation. Yes? No, you would, if you're going to transfer from one region to the other, I believe you would have to have another provision system, you know, sitting idle, waiting for it. But, yes? If you can solve that, you have yourself a multi-million dollar company. So he, he asked how can you verify the chain of custody. So it's compressed, signed, and encrypted, which may be good enough in court, but you still have to prove it. Or the, the lawyer has to prove that it's good enough and the, has to defend against what the other attorney would say. So it's, it's kind of like getting a PCI audit. You, know, you may think it's all good, but then it could get torn apart by an auditor. Or if you ask one auditor, or you ask the same question to five auditors and you'll get 10 different answers. It's, it's, it's kind of the same boat. You know, there, I don't think there's a lot of precedent set for this kind of thing. And given that I just found it recently, I, honestly, I have no idea how long this functionality has even been around. Does anyone know? Has anyone used this to date? No? All right. Definitely warrants further investigation. So this is an experiment. So these guys, I, yeah, they are guys. Uh, they wrote this paper and they actually sent it to me, this, uh, you know, very nice of them. They used traditional tools to do analysis and this is the time it took and these are all the things that you had to trust along the way in order to have this as a valid forensic image. So as you can see, they had to trust the operating system, the hardware vendor, the host, uh, or the, sorry, the hypervisor, network, hardware. You know, that's a lot to trust and to prove trust. But I like this, so AWS export, that's the one I was just talking about, 120 hours. And that includes their FedEx priority from Amazon while they sat there and waited. The time's included in there. They got same day service or overnight service, I think it was. So introspection. Um, the easiest way to think about introspection is that it's a sneaky hole that you can go in and start looking at data and no one ever knows you've been there. Uh, the term is definitely not new. It's an old IDS term from, I think, 93 uh, or 86. I'm, I may be getting that wrong. But in a report from uh, a virtual machine introspection-based architecture for intrusion detection by uh, Garfinkel and Rosenblum. Uh, and it's it's defined as a way to get the state or get access to the state of a system. And really, what you can do with VM introspection is you can get covert level of access to read anything that's going. You can see what processes are running. You can see file data. You can see anything that's going on on that system. Luckily, this isn't something that's enabled by default. Uh, it has to be enabled by the provider. So. And not only does it have to be enabled by the provider, that provider has to facilitate access for your tools to use or to take advantage of their introspection technology. It's, it is transparent to the tenant and server, so you're not gonna know anything has happened. So, you know, excellent, very great way to get forensic information. It would be great if they said, all right, law enforcement, we're going to give you, we're gonna do, enable introspection on, the, on our hypervisor, and we're gonna allow law enforcement with a valid subpoena to come in and do this forensic acquisition. But you have to prove that you need it, and then we'll open it up on demand. Um, because we're not gonna leave this open for just anyone. But that's probably a ways out. That might be like a GovCloud thing down the road, but I don't believe that's accessible to anyone now. Uh, with 
with introspection, it's extremely hard to prove not only the integrity of the images collected, because it's, it's kind of a hard process to replicate um, unless you have written you know, everything along the way to utilize the introspection technology and transfer from point A to point B. But if you're the person on, like my defense, if someone found some information that was being held against me in a case, uh, I could just say, how can, I, how can you prove that someone didn't use introspection to put that file on there just to you know, incriminate me? Be like, oh, we can't prove it. You know, maybe, we could, maybe there's logs from the provider, but you know, I, I don't know if there would be logs for something like that. I would hope there's logs. You need some sort of audit trail. Now, instance isolation, just like it sounds. So does anyone remember um, kind of forensic theory? when something goes wrong on a system, or even incident response theory, what's the first thing we do? Pull the plug, right? Take it off the network? Yeah, those, aren't thing, those are things that we've expressly been told not to do. We keep it on the same VLAN. We let it keep communicating so that we can see how it's interact. If maybe we cut, cut the communication channel, and then whatever malware is on there starts formatting the drive. Well, we've just lost a lot of our forensic evidence. Um, a, a lot of the research that I've read, all of these researchers are saying, well, we know we've got to isolate this image. I'm like, no, this goes against everything we've been told. But they've got PhDs and I don't, so we're going to go with what they're telling me. Um, they are saying that we should be doing, and by they I mean Del Port and Oliver, wrote a specific report just on isolating instances in cloud environments for forensic acquisition and investigations. And you know, they, they do this, and for proper isolation of a cloud image, you need to know the location, the physical location of where the instance is. So not just GOIP related info, as if you saw a particular talk earlier on, isn't all that reliable. Where's that one city that everything in the world is from? Kansas. Where, Kansas? Potwin, Kansas. So. A lot of forensic cases in Potwin, Kansas. Uh, incoming and outgoing blocking. So these are your firewall rules. Collection. You know, you have to be, if you're isolating, it still has to be collectible. So you still have to have access to the data. Non-contamination. Can you prove that it is not contaminated? Separation. Is it separate from other isolated instances or from other running tenants in the infrastructure? These are all very hard things to prove and to do, actually, in public cloud environments. And then we get to the cloud service provider. Isn't that a great graphic? I saw that in someone else's paper. I'm like, yeah, I'm totally taking that. <clears throat> Apparently, that's a, a zombie keep calm thing. Uh, service provider, cloud service providers do have very capable and well-trained forensics and incident response people, especially the big guys, because they're at the forefront, and uh, if something goes wrong, you know, it's bad press. So they have teams of people that are trained in doing incident response and forensic acquisitions. The downside is that most of it is for internal information. So a lot of these guys are dual tasked with doing customer support for their stuff and for the corporate stuff, just because, you know, who wants to spend who wants to have just as many people doing customer stuff as they do internal stuff? That's a lot of headcount, a lot of payroll, things like that. Um, so the, these people will sit there, they'll do their, their day jobs, but they'll also help customers if they need help. And, they'll, and, and a lot of times it could just be via standard support channels, maybe a phone call, maybe a news group post. But um, the best way that a, a CSP can help you is to have very clear documentation about how they're going to help you. So that way, you can kind of level set your expectations. You know, I know that I have to do from point A to D, but they're going to help me with E and F. That way, you can be prepared and you're not scrambling around saying, oh, I don't have this data. I guess I can't do this investigation. We'll just re-image the server and put it back out there. So now, you know, you need to know what how much effort they're going to put into it, and that will also help you understand how much effort you need to put into it to actually make them do it. So what you should do, and obviously the bigger company you are, the more, 
the, the more uh, open they are going to be to supplying this kind of information. Ask for samples, examples of past investigations, so full lessons learned reports that show you what happened, my whole forensic timeline, my investigation processes, who was involved. You want to see how well these people can document what it is they're investigating for you and at what point they jumped in and the customer jumped in. Uh, what methodologies they use or if they're just kind of flying by the seat of their pants. I worked at a bank and a university. I can guarantee you it was all very seat of my pantsy. Credentials for staff. You want to know that the people that are doing these investigations aren't, hey, I'm just fresh out of school and this is my first help desk job and I'm now a forensics person. You don't want that unless they're trained forensics people. Uh, interviews with the CSP team members. If you can get them to let you sit down on a phone call or even in a meeting room and interview their incident response and forensic analysts, that'd be great because you can actually understand their knowledge. It, it's really, it's an interview process. It's speed dating for forensics for your CSP provider. CSP uh, uh, future dating or future proposal. Legal issues. I'm not going to spend a lot of time because not only am I not a lawyer, but I'm Canadian. Your laws don't really mean all that much to me. <laughs> so th these are usually the big issues that come up. And whenever someone starts talking about forensics and asking, like, so even in the SANS forensics class that I sat in, we had a lawyer come in on one day and just go through legal code for North America and Europe. And people would be bouncing things off. I'm like, well, what do you think if we did this? And his response was always, I'll ask your lawyer. <laughs> oh, come on, just like throw me a bone, give me something. He's like, yeah, you can ask your lawyer. Thanks, buddy. Uh, <clears throat> so these very common, you know, jurisdiction, seizing data, data preservation, all things that, you know, these are all things that traditional forensics we have to worry about. Just more so, especially with jurisdiction and the seizing of data in cloud environments. Damn. We're going to stay here for another three hours. Hope that's okay for everyone. So some of the existing tools. The existing tools do work. Their ability to help you with the data, the collection and the analysis may be stunted a little bit uh, because these tools, not one of these tools was built for cloud environments. They may have been augmented down the road or supplemented with additional tools, but they were never built saying, I'm going to be a cloud forensic platform. Not one. And it's not just technical challenges that you need to worry about. It's mindset. Uh, if, if you're going to start doing forensics in the cloud, you have to start being comfortable with storing your data and your information in cloud environments. You need to be able to really justify to yourself that hey, I'm processing offsite and that's okay. Uh, same thing with offsite analysis consoles. I don't need a physical tool in front of me installed on my Windows XP system to properly analyze this, uh, this incident or this investigation. I, I should be able to do this with a cloud instance or a workbench of some sort. And there are tools that are evolving. You know, I don't work for either of these companies, but FResponse 404, they have this cloud connector, so you can mount S3 volumes on Amazon. You can mount the HP Rackspace cloud containers. And just like in F-Response fashion, you're mounting them as if it was you know, a physical instance or a physical disk on your system. It makes data collection very easy. Uh, access data, they're starting to offer this service where you're sending a lot of the information over to their private cloud, their data center, and it'll do a lot of deduplication of many servers. I'm not sure how much it costs, um, but you know th this is very architecture intensive for their side, so it's probably not that cheap. And then there's new tools. Has anyone seen GRR yet? It's pretty cool. It's a, it's an ambitious idea, and uh, you know th this really explains it here. Tell me if this machine is compromised. While you're at it, check two or twenty thousand of them. So this is all about the scale of architectures that we have now. You know, Joe saw something weird, check his machine. Joe is on holiday in Cambodia and is on 3G. Like these, these, are, these are tools built to help people that are remote and mobile and out. And, you know, forensically acquired 25 machines for analysis. They're in five continents and none of them are Windows. You know, these, these are big challenges. You know, this is how you get it, install it. It's still an ELF, I believe, uh, but it, it's made by some very smart people. 
And there's a presentation here at the bottom that is a write-up on GRR, and it's a pretty cool tool. Check it out. Now opportunities. It's not all doom and gloom. There are several advantages of using cloud for forensics. And this is the part where you know, a, a lot of my friends who are developers say, you, you have these great ideas, but you never develop anything. Well, I, I'm not a developer. I'm an idea man. <laughs> so I give people, I, I'm a muse. That sounds better. I'm a muse. I want you to take these ideas and go build me tools. And then we can work together to make these tools popular and used. And exactly. So these are some of the things we're going to be talking about. So on-demand forensic workbenches. Wouldn't it be great if something happened on your server, it got compromised, and then you can just say, all right, I'm going to spin up this forensic analysis system and start working. That seems pretty good. I don't have to install software. I can pay for this in a utility fashion, just like cloud. So instead of paying $30,000 for a site license, I can pay by the hour for my forensic image acquisition and analysis tool. Seems like a good idea to me, but I'm pretty cheap, so that's good. Automated timeline generation. Anyone here do forensic timeline generation using things like uh, log to timeline, reg ripper, Excel, <laughs> guessing, pointing at things, praying. So wouldn't it be cool if you could just push a button and start doing timeline analysis and then start bringing it all together and start deduping it so you could actually get rid of some of the cruft and see, hey, where, this is where I should look on all my systems. And then once you have that information, you can apply that data to all of your other systems. Let's say you're Netflix and you have thousands upon thousands of servers. You can now take this information to see if this compromised trail is present on any other servers without having to acquire and do all this information. I think that would speed things up considerably. Come on. So there's also the concept of, okay, we'll keep our data store local for, for timeline generation. We'll pull it in here, and then our analysis console will just access the local data store and pull it down as we need it. Same sort of thing, but we can store it locally for historical data. Hey, Mike. Four? Four? All right. Dynamic analysis workers. What if we have a big job? So working at a university, something would go wrong, and they'd say, hey, something happened in this lab. We don't know which server it was on, but it was one of these 50. And that's when I close my door and start cursing and swearing. So wouldn't it be great if we were able to help spin up extra instances to help actually crunch this data and start helping us do the analysis. And by doing the analysis, I'm talking about things like distributed file carving. Who here has done file carving looking for certain images? So on those 20 some odd machines, like we think this guy was distributing child exploitation photos. Well, this is a university. Everyone that goes into that lab logs onto Facebook. See how many pictures are on that system? So you have to start carving out all the JPEGs and GIF files and then try and figure out what's going on and which of them are allowed, which of them are child exploitation photos and which pictures are just their niece, niece having a bath. You know, it, it becomes very, very hard and very lengthy to start carving out image files or any sort of file from a forensic image. So what if we could just distribute that workload and then start assigning, okay, well this instance is only gonna work on getting rid of PDF files, documents, zip files. This would save a considerable amount of time, especially if it was push button. And we didn't have to do this. We didn't have to load an image and then start using, oh, what's that image one? Uh, an image for file carving. Sorry? Someone say it? What? No? No? All right. There's, there's one application that I'll, you can specify. It's very good for ripping out files, but kind of hit or miss whether it goes because it uses hex information, header information. <clears throat> Multi-cloud analysis servers. Well, again, distributing the workload. If we wanted to start having servers on the west coast and servers on the east coast cloud instances start helping us do this data analysis, 
oh, hey, one of our server or one of our cloud providers went down because this is the same cloud that Netflix is on, and now I can't watch Netflix, get to Pinterest, or do my forensic analysis. Well, if we have multi-cloud dynamic environments, we can still keep doing our work over here. Sounds good to me. And then when it comes back online, this server or this application can know where it left off and can distribute some of the workload back over and keep playing with uh, or keep figuring out how it can help and how it can contribute to file carving and analysis, things like that. So huh, this is a lot of stuff in a short period of time. Uh, if you want some more information, these are very good sources of information. This working group just launched. So far, it's a lot of academic moaning about what we should call cloud forensics, which is why I've skipped the first two meetings. Um, but honestly, if you want to contribute, join, sign up, it'd be great to have some practitioners to, to even out some of the, the multitude of academics that there are in any NIST working group. Um, so yeah, check that out. This is a, this is the most widely used document. So if someone wants to talk about forensics, this is what they go to. Uh, especially any sort of incident response forensic techniques, this is referenced in pretty much everyone's policy documentation somewhere along the way because it's kind of, you know, it's easily accessible and easily digestible. Definitely worth the read. So in summary, you know, we do need to think about cloud forensics a little bit differently. Um, and if anything, keep an open mind. It's not impossible to do forensics in the cloud. It's just harder in some respects and different in other respects. Uh, cloud can be enlisted to help with these complex investigations. You guys just have to build me my tools first. So we'll do a hackathon tonight so you can crack, crank some of these out after. Get a few, get a few beers in you. <coughs> and the existing tools, there's nothing wrong with the existing tools. It's just they have to evolve to actually start helping people do cloud forensics. And uh, with that, thank you. Is there any questions at all? You have to speak up because I'm getting a lot of sound from out here. Yes. So uh, the question was, have I ever done uh, forensic acquisition or analysis of memory on a system? So yeah, so volatile memory. Uh, I definitely have, especially for carving out um, which processes are actively running, uh, as well as you could use active memory for encryption key and password passphrases to actually get at that information. From the, yeah, the live system. So you're, you're thinking along the lines of like shared memory in a hypervisor type environment and how you can't be. Excuse me while I break this poster. Here. Yeah. All right. Someone say something? Two minutes, two minutes. Ah, so yeah. So we, we can talk about that a little bit. It's, it's not impossible, but if you want to get like the memory of the actual cloud server, yeah. then you have to go to the CSP and actually ask if they'll do it. But I, I wouldn't hold my breath on that one. <laughs> like you'll have to get the, uh, the host image and the memory running if the image is up and live. But uh, yeah, once you shut that down, a lot of that volatile information goes poof. Any other questions at all? No? All right. Thanks for coming to the talk. Uh, I'll be around if you have any questions. <laughs>